It's lab number 15, y'all. It's a Kinsen yeah, a Kinsen Laben. Kinsen Lab sure, lecture. It's lab number 15. Here we go, y'all. We're going to talk about hominins today. You know what a hominin is? A hominin is an ape that walks upright. That would be you, your mama, and all of our extinct bipedal ancestors. If I ask you on a quiz, what's a hominin? I'm talking about all of our ancestors and us today. Hominins are bipedal apes. I'm going to ask you uh, what makes Sahel Anthropus chedensis a biped. How do we know that this character walked upright? Well, one thing we can see at the bottom of the skull is the position of the foramen magnum. And it's systematically different in bipeds, like our guy on the left, and different from that of a chimpanzee on the right, or a gorilla, or any quadruped. Notice where the foramen magnum is, the big hole at the bottom of the skull. Here, let me get my little thingy thingy going. The big hole at the bottom of the skull is towards the center of the skull. It's kind of balanced above the spine. Whereas in a chimpanzee or a dog or a cat that walks on all fours, the skull is out in front of the spine and the foramen magnum is towards the back of the skull. Not only that, the orientation of the foramen magnum, the big hole on the occipital bone, is very different. You'll notice it's straight up and down, vertical in a biped, a hominin, and it is kind of on this orthogonal orientation in all of the quadrupeds. This is an orangutan, just for fun. And you can see that when you look at the ST skull. It's ST, short for Sahel Anthropus chadensis. It's not all the way back here at the back of the skull. It's shifted forward, but more importantly, it's aiming downward. So the spine would have been underneath the skull, not behind it like it is in quadrupeds. The next hominin to come along, you probably have heard of Ardipithecus ramidus. Certainly by now, you're familiar with the representative for this species, Artie. Artie is not a human being. Artie's three feet tall. Artie is more ape than human, but Artie walks upright. Along comes the first of the Australopithecines, Australopithecus anamensis. I nicknamed these guys Anna. Three feet tall, very ape-like, shrugged shoulders, long arms, very chimpy looking faces, but they walk upright and they're actually getting better at it. Along comes Australopithecus afarensis, and the famous one for this species, does everybody remember? Lucy. Lucy is not the only fossil we have. She's just one of the more famous ones we have. There are 300 of these recovered for the species Australopithecus afarensis. There are some real clear signs of bipedality in this specimen as well. Following Lucy's species is Australopithecus africanus, a little bit more human in some ways, in other ways still very ape-like. Do you remember the famous representative for Africanus? The Tong Child. We have dozens of these. The Tong Child is just a really interesting story because the Tong Child was swept away by a raptor, some type of eagle, carried this away, uh, the skull away from his mom. Sad story. Let's talk about the anatomy of these early bipeds, early hominins below the waist. By the time we get to the Tong child, by the time we get to Lucy, they're walking upright for a couple of million years and their hips, their knees, their legs, their feet are basically ours. Granted, they only come up to your belly button. They're not people, but below the waist, their bones have evolved for bipedality and they look a lot like yours. How do we know that Lucy's a biped? This is Lucy on the right, that's you on the left. Lucy's got your pelvis. It's wide, it's kind of like a salad bowl. It's not flat like the chimpanzee you see on the left. And the chimpanzee pelvis, the gorilla pelvis, all the other apes, their pelvic bones are very narrow and tall. When you look at a human, you look at Lucy's pelvis, it's much, much wider than that of a chimpanzee. And it's not flat like the chimpanzee pelvis. Lucy has a curved pelvis. I like to say it's like a salad bowl because when you stand upright, gravity pulls all of your organs downward. All of your viscera would slouch and pull and tug like when a chimpanzee walks upright. It's not very comfortable. But Lucy has your pelvis where the shape of it is like a salad bowl. And so it supports all of the organs, all the viscera. It's a pelvis made for bipedality. 
The toe of a chimpanzee is made for grasping. When you look at Lucy's big toe, you can see it's straight in line with the other digits. It's not an opposable big toe like it is in the chimpanzees. It's used in the Australopithecus as a propulsive lever. It's pushed off of. It's not there for gripping onto branches. These guys are fully terrestrial. Let's take a look at this feature. This is one of the more important features guaranteed to ask you on your quizzy quiz quiz. The knees of any hominin tend to angle towards the midline. It's because we, we call ourselves bipeds, but when we walk, we lift the foot off the ground. And then we're basically balancing on one foot at a time. So we're not bipeds when we're actually walking, we're unipeds. Only one foot is on the ground. And by angling our knees towards the midline of our body, our center of gravity that runs right through our bodies is right above the foot. So we don't wobble the way the chimpanzees and gorillas do when they walk upright. When you look at the knees of a hominin like Lucy or Artie, all those early hominins have their center of mass balanced above the foot that is on the ground. And so if you look at an ape, their legs are straight. Yes, Lucy's an ape, but she's a bipedal ape. And that knee angle, boy, I'm making a mess here. That knee angle, look at that knee angle. Oh, that's glorious, look at that. That facilitates bipedality. So when we look below the waist, we're looking at our legs, our feet, our knees. But above the waist, nothing has really changed from very ape-like characters, such as shrugged shoulders, very long arms that go down to their knees. The fingers are long and they're even curved. Very, very ape-like in many, many respects. Now here's where it gets crazy. The skull is a cluster, cluster, uh, it's a mix of characters. Very ape-like at first glance, but if you know what to look for, you're gonna see some human-like characters as well. Let's take a look and see what Australopithecus, like Lucy's skull, what that has in common with an ape. On the right, you've got a chimpanzee skull. On the left, in the middle there, that's the Australopithecus. Take a look at that face that they have in common. It's very prognathic. That word prognathic, if you've taken my class, you know that means projecting. Your face, here's your face on the left. Your face is flat. These guys have a face that go out in front of their eyeballs and that is a very ape-like characteristic. Second, Lucy's got that brow ridge. You don't have the straight ridge of bone going above your orbits. Above your eyes, you've got brain. These guys above their eyes have air space. There's no brain above their eye sockets. Last thing, obviously, the brain size is tiny. Our early ancestors were not very clever, not in terms of brain size, at least, anyway. And while they walked upright, that came millions of years before brains would get big. So if I ask you what characteristics does an Australopithecus, an early hominin, have in common with a chimp, you've got a lot of characters to choose from. But if I ask you what do humans have in common with an Australopithecus, number one, the position of the foramen magnum and the orientation of the foramen magnum. Straight up and down, it shifted forward. These guys might look like apes, but they walk like people. Next, the teeth are radically different in Australopithecines. Your teeth don't look like this. Look at the chimpanzee teeth. They look like serrated blades on a knife, like a bread cutting knife. These things are made for shearing through leaves and fruit, and they don't look like our teeth. Your teeth are made for grinding. They're flat, and so are the teeth of an Australopithecus. If you run your fingers over your teeth, just kind of put your hand in your mouth and go at a wheel, you don't cut your finger on your teeth. You do the same to an Australopithecus, it feels like your teeth. If you do that to a chimpanzee, you're gonna cut your finger. Very different tooth pattern. Notice the canine tooth in Lucy's species is very short and it's almost the same length as all the other teeth in the jaw. Here's the tooth row in the gorilla, or chimpanzee I should say. And check it out, follow that canine, it goes way down below the other teeth. Let me color that in. If you look at yourself, all of the teeth are in the same row. Lucy's teeth are a little bit more, obviously, human-like in that respect. But here's another thing. The thickness of the tooth enamel, the white stuff on the outside of your teeth, when you brush your nasties, that hard white stuff, is twice as thick as it is in a chimpanzee. 
So when you look at Lucy's teeth, when you look at an Australopithecus, they share that very thick tooth enamel. So the teeth of an Australopithecus are basically the teeth of a person. The last thing, if you've taken my class, you know I talk a lot about the position of the lunate sulcus. This is a little groove on the brain that divides the brain from the most rudimentary section to the more important, higher cognitive functioning parts of your brain. If you look for this groove on the brain, on an endocast, the mold of the brain, in humans, this little sulcus, this groove is back here. And it's the same thing in an Australopithecus. What does that mean? Most of the Australopithecus brain is devoted towards higher cognitive processes, same as humans. The majority of your brain does higher cognitive functions and only the back of your brain is responsible for vision. Same thing with Lucy. But the lunate sulcus in a chimpanzee or a gorilla is halfway across the brain. It's not something you can see from the outside, but if you know how to make a cast of the brain case, you see that the chimpanzee brain is basically split in two. Like most other primates, half the brain is devoted to vision. The other half is devoted for higher cognition. Now, they're pretty smart characters, but nothing like Australopithecus would have been. Nothing like a human, obviously. So while Lucy, this is a total mess, while Lucy's species, all the early hominins had small brains, they were redesigned. The position of the lunate sulcus shows us that they were reorganized. Last thing I want to talk about very quickly are the paranthropines. These guys are not part of our direct lineage. They're more like cousins, an evolutionary side branch. These guys would go extinct, but I just want to mention some aspects of their morphology because they basically look like all the other Australopithecines, except they belong to a different genus. And that's because they have some features that nobody else has, like this sagittal crest. You know what the word sagittal means? Because we learned that the sagittal plane runs right down the middle of your body. And you will notice, how do you get rid of this thing? Erase, okay, erase. There we go. The sagittal crest is the anchor site for very powerful muscles of chewing. And these guys had bigger teeth, bigger jaws, and they required massive muscles that reached all the way up to the top of the skull, dug in for a tight grip, and this is very distinctive. These are derived in all of the early Paranthropus. Paranthropus has a sagittal crest. There it is on top of the skull very powerful muscles swept up and then they went right down through the zygomatic arches the zygomatic arches as you remember are the cheekbones and in humans they're very small but in a paranthropus they're ginormous here's the top of the skull looking down this is just a very very powerful set of muscles that would have passed through them and very distinctive you'll always know the difference between a paranthropus and any other hominin by virtue of their sagittal crest and the giant zygomatic arches. Okay, what do I have in store for you guys? Some fun activities. You've got your quiz, as usual. You've also got a written assignment, and all of the answers to the written assignment were discussed in this little video today. So make sure you tighten up your game before you attempt either your quiz or your written assignment, and good luck to you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.